welcome to the Beaver Creek Women's League Candidates Issue Forum for 2020. We have speakers for three issues upon which Beaver Creek City Township and Greene County will vote this year. We have also invited candidates of all contested races and uncontested races uh, to attend and to appear before us today. 16 have accepted our invitation, though not all Speak up, please. were able to attend in person. The list of candidates is available at check-in for all contenders, whether they're coming or not. Uh, promotional inf information is available at those. Uh, candidates, please remember to take your literature with you or we will throw it away. Our format is a three-minute presentation during which one minute and 30 seconds silent warnings will be given to the speaker. These people are right up here in front of us. Questions may be posed from the audience by writing a brief query addressed to the office or the issue, not to an individual. We have Women's League members circulating with three by five cards and pencils, and they'll collect the cards and put them in these bags like this. Uh, if you wish to write a question, please raise your hand and a card will be handed to you. These questions will be organized during our break, which won't be very long, I don't think. Rebuttal opportunities will be allowed and each person running for that office will have a chance to respond to the question. This program is being recorded and will be rebroadcast on Beaver Creek's government access channel. Dates and times to be determined, Mike? Okay. We will begin with the issues. Actually, I changed my mind. We will not begin with the issues. We're going to begin with the Ohio uh, candidates in alphabetical order, regardless of party. So first up, I have Mr. Mark Babb. Mr. Babb, please. Do we have a sanitizer? We don't. Do I speak into this or not? Both, because Both. That, that microphone is for Mike's camera and this, this microphone is for the audience. All right, three minutes will be time. Good morning. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for the opportunity from the Beaver Creek Women's League to speak to people. It's been a difficult campaign, I'm sure, for a lot of us because um, it's difficult to get out and, and meet people under these circumstances, so I think this is an important event. Uh, I'm Mark Babb. I'm running for probate judge in Greene County. I've been a Greene County resident for 25 years. Um, I've been practicing in this county for 15. I'm the managing partner of Bab Anderson, Roland and Smith in Fairborn. Uh, we represent clients in all matters in all courts in Greene County, including probate. Uh, I'm running for uh, probate court. Uh, I'm pleased to say that I've been endorsed by the Greene County Bar Association. Uh, what that means is that the peers and the people that know us both, that have practiced in the courts and that, that know us, have, have decided that, uh, that I'm the better candidate and the one that they want to endorse for the, for the, uh, the position of probate judge. And you may ask why. Well, there's, there are problems in the Greene County Court. Um, I'm running for probate court because someone needs to. Um, judge O'Diam has engaged in a pattern of conduct which the voters in Greene County may find problematic. The first one is what I'll call the courtroom debacle. It's been in the news. It's been to the Supreme Court. Uh, basically, Judge O'Diam, uh, didn't, wasn't pleased with his courtroom, had security issues and uh, size concerns about that, and so he ordered the county commissioners to give him courtroom three, a courtroom which has been under the control of uh, Judge Wolver and Judge Buckwalter in the general division. Um, uh, litigation ensued, it ended up in the Supreme Court, but the bottom line is that the Supreme Court said that he patently lacked jurisdiction. He lacked the authority to issue an order to take courtroom space, to take a courtroom away from other judges. In the process, the county wasted time, uh, some $50,000 in uh, legal fees for the commissioners and for the other judges. Uh, he actually wanted the Greene County residents to pay for his legal fees as, as well, but the Supreme Court said no because you haven't followed the law. What that means is he didn't submit to the competitive bidding process. He chose his own lawyer, and because he didn't follow the law, the Supreme Court said that that they weren't going to order the Greene County pay for his legal fees. Um, he talks about courtroom innovations, and it's true that the website has been updated to, um, <laughs> to allow for uh, PDFs to be viewed. Um, 
what, what he doesn't say, or what the voters need to know, is that, is that he entered into a contract on behalf of the county, some uh, $200,000, even though uh, only the county commissioners and the county administrator can enter into those kinds of contracts. Um, I'm running to restore integrity to the probate court. I'm running uh, with the endorsement of the Greene County Bar Association. Um, I want to thank my firm for supporting me and my family for giving me strength. Thank you. Thank you. Take this. Um, is Mr. Ballard here? He is here. He didn't check in with me. I saw him sneak in. Mr. Ballard, you're up. Again, you have three minutes and you will be tired. Thank you. I won't need three. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me. Um, a good thing about having your speech on the phone is the audience don't know how long it is, so if I go over three minutes to ten minutes, I'm sorry. Um, a little background history. I'm an Air Force veteran who served 21 years in. I also worked as a federal employee, then a private contractor. And now I'm a small business owner, a little franchise owner. I'm married for over 20 years and we have two kids, ages 16 and 11. Why am I running? I'm running because of the lack of empathy being displayed by our current GOP Ohio legislators and our GOP federal government representatives. Before COVID, I thought the GOP harsh laws would change and they would showcase some empathy when it came Americans versus some outside threat. Boy, was I wrong. They're attacking wearing masks in the middle of a pandemic. They're, they were attacking reproductive issues, using COVID as a cover. They were trying to pass laws, loosening gun laws instead of tightening them. And they were sowing discontent across the public by putting cops and Black Lives Matter against each other instead of trying to unify our citizens. Um, the straw that broke the camel's back was when they were supporting the Confederate flag in the middle of the summer with the height of the protests and everything it represents. To paraphrase Ms. Bethune, we live in a world which respects power above all things. Power intelligently directed can lead to all freedom Unwisely directed, it can be a dreadful, destructive force. My top three priorities due to COVID, and I feel our pressing issues in Ohio and across our nation, is medical, make it affordable and accessible to everyone. Education includes expanding broadband in District 10 and throughout Ohio. Employment, having a living wage. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mary Benega, if I pronounced that correctly. No, Mary. Uh, Chris Epley will be next if he wants to come and stand near. Then we can speed this up, I think. There you go, Mary. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mary Benega, and I am running for the State Board of Education, District 10. I am a retired special education teacher with about 35 years in the classroom, and I've spent the last 30 years of my career being an education advocate at both the local, the state, and the national level. I'm running for this office because I believe that public education is truly the foundation of our democracy. If we are to continue as a democracy, we must have a well-educated populace. I'm also running because I believe that any agency that sets the rules and policies for K-12 education should have a strong advocate on it that is a, has been a practitioner to see how those policies actually go into practice in the classroom. I have set my campaign on three key issues. The first is state funding. We must find a better way to fund our schools. We must find a way that is more equitable and stop relying so much on property tax. We also have to figure out how we can allow choice for parents without taking state and local funds away from our public schools. 
all funds that are taken from the, that are public funds should have to find to meet the same standards for accountability so that the public has a clear view of exactly how those funds are being spent. The next issue is the equity issue. We found that there are many inequities in our system. When the schools move quickly from, uh, from in-person to online classes, we found that many students did not have proper access to the internet, that if they did have access, there wasn't enough equipment in the home for every child to be able to do their online work. Combine that with the socioeconomic inequities that we already know are in our system, and we must address these systems. They're hard, hard conversations to have, but we must find ways to better serve our students. The final issue is testing, especially the use of standardized test scores. It, and I believe not only are they overused, but they are also misused. Teachers have to spend far too much time preparing for tests, which takes away time for actual instruction to help the student move forward. Standardized test scores simply let you know how a student does on a particular test on a particular day. It does not measure their true academic success. We must find better ways to let our public understand what's happening in our public schools without shaming or blaming either the students or the districts they're in, but working toward always improving what we do for our students. Our hope for the future is our children and we must invest wisely in our children's education. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Mr. Epley? Is Chris not here? Chris is here. Here he comes. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. My name is Chris Epley. I'm running for the Second District Court of Appeals. I want to thank the Beaver Creek Women's League for hosting this as well as the fire station. This is a great venue. You know, it's been difficult to get out and meet a bunch of people, so I'm really happy to be here. Before I talk about my experience in leadership, I'd like to thank someone, really a friend of mine I've known for almost 52 years, who's in the uh, audience here today. Uh, next month will be 52. My mom, thank you, Connie Epley, for, for joining me and being part of my campaign. I really appreciate it. I was born, raised, and married in, in Dayton. My wife and I have been married for over 18 years. Eileen and I have two children. Our son, Jack, is 17 and our daughter Lily turns 15 tomorrow, so that's a pretty big day. I remember where I was 15, 15 years ago today. It's, uh, it's a great day for us, and so we're looking forward to celebrating as a family. Leadership, I believe, is important. Uh, I've had the great opportunity to serve my, my school as a school board member some years ago, and I'm currently in the second term on city council where I live. I'm also an avid, a, a, a big member of my Rotary Club, where we believe service above self is important, and that's the way I live my, my life. I've, had the great opportunity to, to be around servant leaders, serving in both of those positions, and you really get to see what it means to, to serve our communities, because I think that's important. I've also served with the Dayton Bar Association and Ohio State Bar Association as a Life Fellow. Went through that program and, and was honored to, to serve there as well. As far as experience goes, the following three reasons I am the most qualified to be your next Court of Appeals judge. Number one, I teach it. I teach appellate practice and procedure at the University of Dayton School of Law and I've been involved with the program since 2001. Number two, I'm the chief appellate counsel in the Vandalia Municipal Court. If there's, an, if there's an appeal of a trial court decision, it comes across my desk and I handle it. And number three, I sit as a judicial magistrate in Dayton Municipal Court. I've been doing that since 2009. It's a part-time position. If they, I'm one of a few people they call if someone um, is on vacation or out of town. I, I sit and I listen to both civil and criminal matters, so I have that bench experience and I, I believe that's really important when you're looking at your next judge. So for those three reasons, I'd like you to consider me Chris Epley for Court of Appeals. Thank you again, everyone. I appreciate it. Mr. Hackett, Bob is up. You know, it's hard to, to hear us. First of all, I want to thank the Beaver Creek Women's League. It's great to be here. You know, my background is as a successful businessman in the 20 years I've spent as a county commissioner, state rep, and, and state senator have, have really strongly prepared me for my role as, as a state senator. As a businessman, I understand the importance of being a fiscal conservative. I've worked diligently to bring jobs to the, to the area and have been very successful at doing that. Uh, 
And also, many of us have worked in Ohio to rid Ohio of unnecessary and, un and unproductive regulation. And this is another area where we've been very successful. In addition to a number of Business Legislator of the Year awards that I've won, I'm very proud of my Ohio Mental Health Legislator of the Year award by, by Ohio NAMI and the Disability Legislator of the Year award. And as a county commissioner, I was the one that brought Life Care Alliance and the Meals on Wheels to Madison County. I've been a strong voice for higher ed, especially for our public universities like Clark State, Central State, Columbus State, Wright State, Ohio State, and I'm, I'm proud of the dollars we've been able to help direct them to the capital budget. I'm especially proud of our success at Central State in making them a, uh, getting them to be a land-grant university. I believe K-12 to education should be con controlled at the local level, and I do believe parents should have a choice on where their children go to school. I have a strong working relationship with the superintendents in all, my all three counties. I've also been a strong supporter of Wright Pad and law enforcement. Wright Pad is, is the economic driver, Rick will tell you, is the economic driver of our district, and he and I have worked on legislation that has benefited strongly both the base and the citizens of Ohio. I've already mentioned that creating jobs and improving the business environment will always be a key objective. Working our way out of this pandemic is, of course, on everyone's mind. We want to keep people safe, but at the same time, we, we don't want to tremendously hurt the economy. So I do, I go on record, I want businesses back in operation, but I want the environment to stay safe. I've always stated that I wanted to be involved with committees where I have strong expertise. And I have a strong financial service background, insurance and investments. And I've been insurance chair both in, in, the, in the House and I'm, of course, insurance chair in the Senate. Uh, I'm a member of a number of committees, including the Ag Committee, Ways and Means, Local State Government, and Health Committee. Looking ahead, everybody has to understand this, we'll be facing a really difficult budget because of the, of the pandemic. And remember, Ohio, we must balance our budget. But look back to 2011. We had the worst budget deficit in history when Kasich started, $8 billion. Not only did we balance the budget, but we cut taxes. We know the ways to bring Ohio back. There are other areas that need work. You know, we need to do a better job of controlling health care costs. You know, the, I'm from the business community. We've been promised for years of doing a, of health care costs would get control. But we, that hasn't happened. But we need to do a better job in that area. Local and state governments need to work much more efficiently. But, but change is hard for them. And when you look at that. In closing, I, I'm asking for your vote today from someone who is... Thank you. Okay. Bye. I only had one sentence no, that's left. Okay. Bye. All right. Thank you. Mr. Is it Mr. Marshall? Mr. Lackman or Latchman? Tell me how to pronounce your name properly. You pronounce it for us. How about? Thank you. Good morning. I am Marshall Lockman. I am running for judge of the Second District Court of Appeals. First of all, I want to thank you for this opportunity. Unfortunately, in these times, we don't have as many opportunities as we'd like, so any opportunity we have to talk to voters and explain our background, our qualifications, it's, it's a great opportunity. Um, I have been, I've been a resident of the Miami Valley for more than 25 years. I raised my three children in this community. Uh, my wife, Amy, and I will watch our youngest daughter, Abby, graduate from Centerville High School uh, next spring. I am running for judge of the Court of Appeals because I believe I am the experienced candidate. I've been practicing law for nearly 32 years. All those 32 years, I have been a litigator. I've spent thousands of hours in courtrooms, both in Illinois and in Ohio. My initial practice in Illinois involved more civil matters, uh, personal injury, products liability, breach of contract, had many trials on those issues back in Illinois. Over the last almost 17 years now, I have practiced here in Ohio. Um, primarily doing criminal defense litigation, both at the appellate level, where I have handled more than 100 appeals in the area's courts of appeals, primarily in the second district, the very court that I now seek to sit on, as well as having argued many times in the Ohio Supreme Court. I've also done a lot of trial work, handling everything from basic misdemeanors to the most serious of felony off offenses, including capital murder. In fact, I am one of only three attorneys in the six counties of the Second District Court of Appeals who is certified by the Ohio Supreme Court to be appointed as lead counsel in death penalty cases. Not because I took a, only took a class or because I took a test, but because I have tried so many serious felony cases and have tried several death penalty cases as co-counsel. 
I am proud to have been honored by the judges of the Montgomery County Common Pleas Court on two separate occasions, most recently in 2016, when I was awarded the Gideon Award for my lifetime achievement in the representation of indigent defendants in that court. I've also represented children in the, the area's most vulnerable children as a guardian ad litem in abuse, neglect, and dependency cases. I believe who we elect as judges matter. I believe it is important for people to get information. We've seen that in the last couple weeks. Our judges matter. I am someone who's gonna sit on the bench, decide cases, not with any preconceived ideas of what the law should be, but applying the law as it exists. I ask for your support on November 3rd. Again, I am Marshall Lockman, and I am running for judge of the Second District Court of Appeals. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Lampton. Brian, yep. And Mr. O'Dayan, you will be next. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, you're up next, okay. I'd like to thank the Beaver Creek Women's League for having this event today. You always do a great job. My name is Brian Lampton. I'm running for the Ohio House uh, Reps District 73. I'm the Republican nominee. I'm a 30-year insurance agency business owner serving customers throughout the Miami Valley. I've been involved in our community just about as long. Past president of the Beaver Creek Chamber, Rotary, Green Bucks, current president of the Fairborn Chamber. I've also been active in professional associations, National Association of Insurance Financial Advisors and Professional Insurance Agents Association. I've served on a few political boards and committees over the years. The Beaver Creek 9-11 Memorial, which was my favorite, uh, the Charter Review Committee, as well as some time with the Board of Elections. As an insurance agent, I am charged with the fiduciary responsibility with my customers and my companies. And in 30 years, I've never had a misconduct or violation. I take that responsibility very seriously. I'm also a big believer in transparency. I'm not a career politician. I'm a local business owner who wants to serve you in the legislature. I'm a proven leader and obviously involved in a community. I will fight for our Constitution, especially our Second Amendment. I'm endorsed by the Ohio Buckeye Firearms Association and the NRA. I am pro-life and endorsed by Ohio Right to Life. I'm also pro-business. I'm endorsed by the Ohio Association of Construction Trades, United Engineers and Operators, as well as the National Federation of Independent Business. I'm hearing from many business owners and they're concerned about getting Ohio fully opened. I've witnessed firsthand for my customers and their struggles and difficulties, having to lay off good employees, borrowing money from their retirement plans to keep operating, and in some cases, businesses have just closed permanently. I will also fight to reduce taxes because that's a cornerstone of a thriving economy. We must reduce government regulations, improve efficiencies so that revenues can be redirected to uh, meaningful programs and less bureaucracy. I will work on school funding reform. In fact, there's legislation right now that uh, might get passed before the end of the year. I pledge to continue Representative Perales' commitment to protecting Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and the missions there. We need to make sure we have skilled, a skilled, trained workforce to fill the jobs that are coming to our base. I live in Beaver Creek. I will continue to run my insurance office so you can come in and see me and share your concerns. My name is Brian Lampton and I approve this message. Thank you, Brian. Thanks. Next we have Tom O'Dayan. Good morning, my name is Tom O'Diam. I am judge of Greene County Probate Court and I'm running for uh, re-election to my second term. I'm the best choice for this position because my credentials and experience in probate law are simply unmatched. I spent 28 years in private practice focusing on probate law and built a highly successful law practice right here in Beaver Creek. I was certified as a specialist in probate law. For the last seven years, I've served as your probate judge in Greene County. During my first term, I've worked hard to modernize our court. I developed new systems and resources to improve public service. I've implemented new processes and tools to make probate more understandable. And during the recent COVID shutdown last spring, I demonstrated innovative leadership 
By operating our court remotely for two months as a cyber court, with no interruption of our service, and gain national, local, and state recognition for creative use of technology. It cost the taxpayers $142. I also created our annual Adoption Day celebration, which is my favorite thing of all. Its purpose is to raise awareness to the desperate needs of foster children in our community and to provide the public with an opportunity to experience the true joy of a child finding a permanent and loving home. To the contrary, my opponent is a criminal defense attorney with no probate experience. He's never even filed a case in Greene County Probate Court while I've been judge. Instead, my opponent is seeking to create doubt about me by running a campaign of deception, misinformation, and half-truths to discredit me and to slander my family. It's a smokescreen to hide his own lack of any relevant credentials and experience that are even remotely qualify him to be a probate judge. A judge must be completely honest at all times, but my opponent has done nothing but lie in this campaign. He's lied about the courtroom dispute with the commissioners. He's lied about money my daughter paid me for the redemption of my stock when I was forced to retire. He lied about my daughter's restricted practice in my court, and he's even lied about being managing partner of the largest law firm in Greene County. It's not. If we can't trust him to be honest about these things, how can we ever trust him to be honest as a judge? I wasn't elected to be friends, best friends with attorneys, nor was I elected to be nice to people that lie, steal, and cheat in court. I was elected to protect your rights, and that's exactly what I've done. That's exactly what I will continue to do as judge. I'm not perfect by any means, and none of us are, but I think if you look at my record, it proves that I've worked hard and I've used my experience to make our court a model of innovation for the state of Ohio. I have and always will be completely honest, transparent, and lawful in every respect as my judge. Thank you for your vote. Thank you for your time. Thank you, audience. Thank you. Uh, if anyone has a question he or she would like to pose for any of our candidates who have just appeared or who will appear shortly, Please fill out a card. We have someone who is able to take that card, and uh, we will vet the questions. And then after a short break, we will ask each candidate to answer the question asked. Is there a representative for Desiree Timms here? Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you to the Beaver Creek Women's League for hosting this forum today. It's great to have an opportunity to speak a little bit about Desiree Timms, about her background, and about why she's running for Congress for Ohio's 10th Congressional District. So Desiree is the granddaughter of sharecroppers who moved from the Deep South to Ohio to look for a better life. Her grandfather worked in the steel mills here, and he had to leave public education at the age of six so he could provide for his family. It's that mentality and value system that Desiree grew up with. It's why she worked so hard through her time in public education. It's why she was able to push herself and thrive and succeed in West Dayton. It's why she was able to work her way through both undergraduate and law school, becoming the first in her family to graduate from a four-year college. And it's that mentality of hard work and looking out for working families like her own that pushed her to go to Capitol Hill, to work as a policy advisor on issues that were incredibly important, like agriculture, to this community. But when she was in Washington, she saw something that was alarming and has become all too familiar to all of us, that too few folks who live in communities like this one weren't represented folks like prescription drug companies, folks who were representing special interests were getting free access to members of Congress, but the reality was if you worked for a trade union, if you were someone who had an issue for everyday people, you weren't getting seen. And that inspired her to run for Congress because we need change here in this community. 
Congressman Turner has represented uh, this area in some form or another for over 25 years, and the results speak for themselves. Too many have been left out. We need to invest in infrastructure. We need to support skilled laborers. We have to defend protections for pre-existing conditions. We need to pass common sense gun safety regulations. We need to lower prescription drug costs, and we have to shore up and defend and prevent any attacks on Social Security and Medicaid. The reality is, ladies and gentlemen, that this district needs change. Congressman Turner has not been providing the leadership that we all deserve, and it's time for a change. Thank you all very much for hosting us this forum, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have some Green County candidates up. Mr. Fisher, running for sheriff, Sheriff Fisher, is here, but he opted not to speak, but you certainly may ask him a question if you like. So first I have up Stephanie Goff. And Craig Hagler will follow. Okay. Thank you, I'm Stephanie Goff, Green County Engineer. Um, I started off as Green County Engineer with the Memorial Day tornadoes last year, so it's been an adventure of a first year with COVID on top of it. Um, I'm an Indian Lake graduate, um, have my undergrad from University of Cincinnati, but my MBA from Wright State, and I'm a professional engineer and professional surveyor. Those are actual requirements that are required to be a county engineer, is actually to be a professional engineer and a professional surveyor. I have roots here in Greene County. My dad graduated from Fairborn and Greene County Career Center. My mom graduated from Tecumseh. And I've lived here for the last 15 years. My grandparents also were here for the base. So I believe I have a strong root here in Greene County. Um, started off with the Logan County Engineer's Office in Bell Fountain, then became city engineer for Fairborn, and then became village administrator for Jackson Center, which is like a, village, like a city manager and then Montgomery County Engineers as a senior engineer before getting the opportunity to become Green County Engineer last year. Made a lot of upgrades in the last year and a half. Started off with some technology upgrades after getting calmed down from the tornado cleanup. We've updated some regulations. We're continuing to update regulations in our office. And we're also working on development capital improvement plans. We're also looking at a lot of safety improvements on our roads around the county. We've secured safety money to study the intersections, which will help us to be able to secure funding for construction at these intersections. Some of the ones you are very familiar with in this area, we're looking at improvements at Dayton, Xenia, and Trabine, Indian Ripple at Alpha Bell, Fairgrounds at Hilltop, also up in Fairborn at Byron at 235, and some other intersections. We're looking to try to improve those intersections that we know have high, high crash history. Um, so I want to just thank you for this opportunity to be able to speak to you. I am unopposed. But I want to thank you for this opportunity and look forward to continuing to provide safe roads and bridges to you and the citizens of Greene County. And thank you for your vote of confidence in November. Thank you. I guess I can't do that. I'm going to try to wipe the mic. Awkwardly I at hope best. it doesn't slip out of my hands. Me too. <laughs> thank Be you. Be careful. Thank you. Craig Hegler, Green County Treasurer. Uh, I'll be brief. I'm running unopposed. Um, born and raised in Green County, graduated of Wright, Wright State University. Um, the big thing we've done over the last two years uh, since being appointed treasurer when Commissioner Gould took over uh, next door was we implemented security to our office. So first thing, uh, within the, the first several months, we uh, obtained cash control. So we actually put all of our cash drawers under lock and key. Um, cash cannot be uh, co-mingled between different uh, tellers. Secondly, then we implemented a cashiering system to track all that cash. Um, recently, we just added a two-step authentication process uh, to avoid phishing as uh, my office is one of the main targets for cyber attack because we handle the bank accounts. So last week, we just implemented security. Um, going forward in the next several months, we're actually updating our credit card system to make it easier for taxpayers to pay electronically online. So. I look at a, as an elected official as a job. This is my daily go and grind and, and do more for the citizens. So each day I go in there and see how I can improve the office. I look forward to continuing, it, continuing that over the next four years. Uh, thank you for your time. I wish we had the cookies because they are excellent, but next year. Thank you. David Hayes. Mr. Hayes. Oh, sorry. 
going. If you would like to use hand sanitizer, you may. All right. But the microphone is still quite slippery from up to the Thank you. You're welcome. I'll stick it right here. There you go. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is David Hayes. I am the Republican candidate for Greene County Prosecuting Attorney. I am, in fact, the only candidate for Greene County Prosecuting Attorney, but I think it is important that any candidate uh, opposed or otherwise makes himself available to the voters. Uh, so to that end, I just wanted to introduce myself and respectfully ask for your vote on November 3rd. I am an assistant prosecutor in Greene County. I have been for the past 15 years. I'm currently the chief trial counsel for the criminal division of the Greene County Prosecutor's Office. In addition to my experience trying cases, I've tried over 60 jury trials. I've handled over 2,700 criminal cases in my career. Uh, in addition, I am a military veteran. In 2016, I retired after a 24-year career with the United States Air Force Reserve, uh, where I was both enlisted and commissioned. Um, so I have been a follower uh, and I have been a leader. Uh, my priorities with regard to the office, uh, number one, uh, will always be making sure that we aggressively prosecute violent offenders here in Greene County. Uh, and to that end, we are going to focus on training our attorneys, and we're going to do so in a fiscally responsible way. We have forfeiture funds that are available for training. Uh, it is my intention to make sure that all of our felony prosecutors go to the latest and most up-to-date training with regard to violent crimes, specifically sexual assaults and crimes involving uh, children of abuse. Uh, those, are the tri those are the toughest cases to try, and I want to make sure that our attorneys are prepared to do that at all times. Uh, secondly, we need to talk about drugs. You can't talk about crime without talking about drugs. Drugs are the fuel uh, of the criminal justice system, uh, and I intend to work with Whoever is the new common pleas judge, if they want to develop a drug court, the prosecutor's office will support them. We will also explore the possibility to, of a diversion program, but that depends in large part upon uh, the county commissioners and the budget situation, which we all know uh, is going to be tough during the next probably 24 months. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions if you have any for me, but again, my name is David Hayes. I am running for a Green County Prosecutor, and I respectfully ask for your vote on November 3rd. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perales. Do you want this? You may use it. Please. You don't have to open it yourself. Thank you. Well, good morning. I am Rick Perales, your state representative for the 73rd District, uh, the western side of Greene County. Very pleased to be here today. I want to thank the Beaver Creek Women's League for setting this up. It's, it's uh, very important, especially in these times, that uh, we uh, allow our voters as much knowledge and education on issues and candidates as possible so that uh, they're able to make the proper vote for themselves. Uh, I am married to Becca. We have four children, seven grandchildren. Um, and we live in Beaver Creek and we have a blessed life. We're very grateful. Uh, a little bit about me. I, um, I've been in elected uh, official capacity for a number of years now. I used to be the uh, young guy, not so much anymore. I'm the mentor, um, but I've enjoyed every bit of it. I started off in Beaver Creek as the mayor for a couple years. Then I went to Greene County, the job I'm striving for today, served two terms, eight years. And then I went to the state house as the state uh, representative and I'm in my final year I'm termed out. Termed out uh, is a whole another subject we can talk about term limits. Uh, all I need to say here is uh, when I, my term limit was coming up Becca and I talked long and hard we prayed what's next for us what do we do and, and hours and hours of this and and it's it, kind of funny we we're just walking to to the jobs early in the morning out the garage and, and it hit us both at the same time. She said it, not me, but it was, it was who I am. You're about service. You always have been, and you're good at it, and we know what you need to do. And that's when I applied to run for Greene County Commissioner. Service is an important word for me, and you'll hear it a lot. Um, I started off, as I said, as a Beaver Creek mayor. I went to Greene County. I've got those, that experience at uh, all levels, uh, local government and state government. Uh, Bob Hackett, Senator Hackett, thank you for all your help, uh, Senator Hackett. We were a great team. 
Um, uh, thank you for your help with Wright Pat. You said it, Brian said it, Wright Patterson is huge. And anyone here that doesn't get that, they just don't understand how things work. Um, we have 26,000 troops, civilians here, and we are one of the strong bases that always are looking at opportunities. We have Space Command coming up. I'm working hard on that. As a former CE commander there, um, and the bills that I've done to make life better for veterans and military life, um, are very vital towards that end. So I think that I bring a lot of tools and resources that nobody else have, has towards that. So I would just say this, in the final analysis, I ask that you all look at our records, me and my opponent's record, and compare us. Look at what we've done to prepare ourselves to serve the people of Greene County. I think if you look at that and you ask the question, who am I most comfortable with that has taken the time, energy, and effort to do that, you'll come up with the same conclusion as I did. I'm the right person for this job. I'd appreciate your consideration on November 3rd, if you haven't already voted, and thank you very much again for hosting this event. Thank you. AJ Williams. You're doing great. You're doing great. It's an easy gig. It's an easy gig? It's a, this is an easy gig. Hi, I'm AJ Williams. I'm your Greene County Clerk of Courts. I'm also a proud member of the Beaver Creek Women's League, so you're welcome for putting on the event. And I'd like to thank uh, Beaver Creek Township, the Fire Department. Uh, we have our Township Administrator here. I saw Alex O'Hara and uh, Township Trustee Tom Kretz, so thank you. Um, I'm thankfully unopposed, and it's a, it's a very good feeling, but Mr. Hayes is right. It's a good opportunity for any questions you have for myself or the office. We need to make ourselves available any chance we can. Uh, just a quick update on the office. We went through our pandemic pretty well. We were one of the few offices that stayed open. Our title office stayed open and our legal division stayed open. So we were a little bit down in the courthouse and at the title office. So we took that opportunity to cross train. So currently every staff member of the office knows how to do at least one other job. And when I came in, everyone just had a specialty. And if there was a, a vacation or an illness, we, we were kind of up the creek without a paddle. So now in that downtime, we took the opportunity to cross train and many courthouse, member, courthouse staff members can work at the title office and vice versa. So it's been very helpful. Um, I make myself available afterwards and there's a lot of issues and candidates that have opposition. So I would like to yield the rest of my time. So thank you. Very kind of you, thank you. Okay, the remaining speakers are for our issues that are up uh, pretty locally. Issue one, Pete Landrum. I'm sure it's lubricated by now. Uh, Pete Landrum, City Manager of Beaver Creek. Issue one, proposed income tax of 1%. Uh, if approved by voters, the income tax would not become effective till January 1st of 2022. Upon the approval of the 1%, uh, current voted the 3.4 mil street levy would not be renewed and would expire December 31st of 2021. That's per the ballot language and thus reducing property taxes. The purpose of the income tax is to provide funds for the purpose of general municipal operations, maintenance, equipment, municipal services and facilities, infrastructure and capital improvements in the city of Beaver Creek, including the $200 million of backlog in infrastructure projects and while this will diversify the city's revenue sources and require funding from all those who utilize city services. The revenues currently generated by the voted 3.4 mil levy will be appropriated annually to reduce the street funds uh, of the expiring levy per the city tax code. If approved, it will also help reduce or eliminate the need for future city property tax levies for police, parks, and streets. Some quick facts here. Number one, reduces city property taxes by expiring the 3.4 mil street levy, uh, about $100 per 100,000. While some believe that it is a small reduction, this revenue actually accounts for 21.4% of the city's total property tax revenues received. It's not small for the, for the, for the city. 
All persons working in Beaver Creek will pay the income tax, including those persons who do not live in Beaver Creek. It's estimated about 75% of the workforce in Beaver Creek are non-residents, and who, who uh, residents who also work somewhere without an income tax will also be subject to the tax. But for the first time, residents will not be financially responsible for 100% of the city's infrastructure and city services as the income tax would collect from those non-resident workers to assist in paying for infrastructure, uh, maintenance, and city services. Uh, exemptions include uh, retirement income, Social Security, active military, dividends, capital gains, alimony, child support, unemployment, and more. Uh, residents already paying an income tax, this is important, to other cities will receive 100% credit up to the 1% uh, per the city tax code. And per the tax code, this credit cannot be changed without voter approval. Um, for more information and resources, please visit the city's website, beavercreekohio.gov. You'll find the income tax estimator, the InTouch Special Edition, which we have copies back there, frequently asked questions, city's tax code, the ballot language, uh, all the budgets, uh, including a link to the Ohio checkbook for transparency. Thank you. Issue 20, Paul Otto. Thank you, Mary. First of all, I'd like to thank Beaver Creek Women's League uh, for offering this, uh, not only for the candidates, but for the issues as well. I'm here today representing Beaver Creek City Schools. I'm Paul Otten, superintendent. Tell you a little bit about our uh, initiative, our issue. It's a 9.8 mil substitute emergency levy. It's got a big name on it, but the key word in there is substitute. It will substitute a current existing 9.8 mil levy that's already on the book. So it will not raise taxes for our residents. So I'll give you a little story or a little history behind this. In 2001, the school district ran a uh, emergency levy that was approved, and then in, in 2003, a second one was uh, ran and approved. So we had two separate subs or two separate emergency levies. In 2010, the district decided to take those two levies because they were very close and move them into one very large emergency levy. That it was a 11 mil emergency levy that generated $18,517,600. That has been on the books since 2010. What we have today is the exact same thing, but it's a 9.8 mil because House Bill 920, which was passed in 1976, rolls back those taxes. So the millage rate always has to adjust so that the district always gets the same amount of money. So there's no inflationary growth for school districts. So one of the problems that you look at Today we have a 9.8 mil levy generating that same $18,517,600. So if this would be approved, uh, what it'll do is it will lock our, our uh, residents in at that same rate that they're paying today. We will not have an increase in taxes on this levy. But the one thing that a substitute emergency levy does do that no other levy allows or no other levy uh, permits to happen is it does give us inflationary growth on new construction, whether that's residential or commercial. So the district does get a benefit financially from all the growth that's happening, not only in the township, but in the city. Uh, typically, so when the easiest way to look at it is today that, that 9.8 mil levy generating $18.5 million for our district, those are the same funds that we were living off of in 2001 and 2003. So no additional growth. That's why you always hear school districts are always coming back because there's no growth as cost goes, goes up. So that's it. If you have any questions, obviously, I would t tell you if you leave here today, email me or call me. We would love to answer any of those questions you might have, but we appreciate your support on November 3rd. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa Howell is here to address, address issue 25. I urge you to write your question. Raise your hand. Does anyone have a birthday? We could sing happy birthday while I'm doing this. Great. Say the you alphabet. all know that now. Thank you. Well, thank you again for having the Health District come and speak to all of you. It's a pleasure to be with all of you, and I appreciate the time and opportunity. I'm here to talk to you about um, the Health District's 
five-year, 0.8 mil operating levy that is a renewal levy, so it's no increase in taxes. It supports about a third of our overall budget, and um, these are levies that have been in place for over the last 50 years. Of course, our agency has been a mandated agency for 100 years now since a uh, pandemic flu back in 1918. So um, I will just tell you a little bit about what we do beyond what you're probably most familiar with. And that is things like provide birth and death certificates to all residents in the community. We do all the permitting for wells and septic systems. We also do all the permitting for your commercial and residential plumbing. And then also we license and inspect all restaurants and all grocery stores throughout our community in Greene County. On the maternal child side, we have programs that support families, nutritional programs like WIC, programs that support children who have developmental delays, we provide home visiting, and we also provide support, financial support to families who have um, children with serious medical conditions and they need additional support. Probably what we are both most well known for um, is um, communicable disease, and um, probably in the last five years, some of our successes have been, in 2018, there was a hepatitis A outbreak, and we responded by giving 350 vaccinations and brought that to resolution very quickly. Last year, of course, we were heavily involved in um, the tornado response. And then this year, of course, pandemic flu. Our response is always the same. We detect there's a problem. We set up command. It was a multi-jurisdictional, multi-agency response. We respond. We bring it to resolution. And then we, are, we stay prepared for the next time something happens. Looking ahead, of course, uh, we know it's been a bumpy road. Pandemics historically have affected physical health, psychological health. They have social impacts, they have economic impacts. We've provided support not only to your courts, your libraries, your schools, your universities, and your business community to open everything back up. Um, so we are prepared, we will continue to be prepared, um, and it's been a pleasure to serve the residents of Greene County, and we um, appreciate your support in the future. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Fire Department. This is great. I, I hope we can do this again, because we have lots of room, and maybe without COVID, we could even be more crowded and fit more people in. In response to more than uh, one inquiry, if someone, an individual, wishes to know about campaign contributions and contributors, all they have to do is go to the local Board of Elections office, People have to, candidates have to file midway through the campaign, and then they have to file again at the end. So you will see if corporations or individuals have given to a running candidate. So thank you for that. Um, our first question is for Pete Landrum. Is the income tax called an income or earnings tax? and will it tax earnings from investments? You have one minute as soon as you get here. Uh, we call it an income tax, but I think by Ohio Revised Code, it's an earnings tax uh, is the language that is used. Um, investments, if it's not a retirement fund, so if it's a, you know, capital gains isn't, interest not, dividends aren't, so I, I don't know what type of uh, specific investments, but uh, mostly are, are not uh, because that's not considered earned as far as like a wage uh, where you're you know, working a job. Those are more of an investments of uh, capital gains and or interest or dividends. Okay. Yes, and then when you say on issue one that seniors won't pay, does that include seniors on a state pension, OPERS? That's a retirement, OPERS. So yes, that does include, that's an exempt income. The, uh, let me specify something very clear. 99 point, almost 9% of our tax code is right out of the Ohio Revised Code. So every exemption that is listed is state law. This is not a tactic that Beaver Creek uh, did as far as to try to develop a, who can we get to vote for that. You know, we're a neutral candidate. We're providing the information to you. 
Uh, so it, it is straight out. So any type of retirement income, whether it be o, o PERS or uh, any kind of public retirement or anything that's considered retirement uh, is exempt income per state law. Okay, that's it. Good Thank you me. so much. Yeah. Mr. Hackett, do you have a moment? Yes. Um, there has been buzz around a proposed tax abatement for land developers. Do you know anything about this and would you share what you know with us? Yes, a lady in the, in the audience asked me this question is people realize that in like Madison County we compete against Hilliard in Dublin and they're just loaded with money so we give tax abatements to attract companies to Madison County but we make it on the income tax and so all those businesses are in the village etc. So what has passed the Senate is on big, one of the problems with businesses right now is they can't find employees, especially before the pandemic hit. And so one of the things that put more in the, in the commissioner's toolbox, we gave the ability for big projects to qualify for an enterprise zone, which is a 10-year abatement. So that's what that is. If, B, if Green County wants to do that, they can do that if the legislation passes. It's just as passed the Senate so it's just pending. So that's what that is. It's just legislation is pending, but what they're trying to do is they're trying to incentivize, and it would be on new projects and big projects, but residential projects, which they don't have now. Thank you. You have to grab it this time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this would be for Mr. Odiam and Mr. Babb as Greene County probate judge uh, contestants. Please tell us one accomplishment of yours specific to probate law that positions you as the best candidate for probate judge. Mr. Babb, would you answer that question first? Over there. Again, you have one minute. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you for your question. I think when we look at the qualifications for being judge, the important things aren't just some sort of background or knowledge. What's important in being a good judge is having good judgment. We put people in positions of trust when they become judge. And what we, what we expect from judges is them to, to follow the law, to be fair and impartial. And, and fairness with the parties and the litigants is the most important thing. I've had lots of accomplishments. In my practice, I've been recognized by other attorneys as being a successful attorney. I've been running my own practice for 15 years. Uh, I'm supported by the Bar Association, and I think I'm very well qualified to be judge in probate court. Thank you. Mr. O'Dayan. I would strongly disagree with that answer because in probate court as a specialty court, experience and honesty are the two biggest things that matter. I don't really know where to start with as far as an accomplishment, but I would say one of, one of my um, proudest accomplishments as, as Greene County probate judge is um, we, we completely revamped every single process and procedure in our office and used it as a training method for all of our new employees. We have a, a local rules that is um, very comprehensive, it's online, and it's used as a model in other probate courts now in the state of Ohio. We have a library of hundreds of forms to make the processes and procedures in probate court easier. Um, again, I strongly disagree that just being an attorney is enough. Um, it, it shows a complete lack of understanding of probate court. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now we have a question for those who are running for Court of Appeals, Mr. Lackman and Mr. Epley. Do you believe in the death penalty? Mr. Lackman, would you like to answer that question? The question is, do you believe in the death penalty? As a judge, we are required to follow the existing law as it exists. Um, so the answer, first of all, in Ohio, there is a death penalty. Uh, thank you. Uh, in Ohio, there is a death penalty. The 
law allows in certain cases if certain um, specifications are indicted and a jury finds a defendant guilty of certain specifications, the death penalty becomes an option. My, as far as personal beliefs, as a judge, I would follow the law. Personal beliefs is I believe that death penalty is appropriate in certain circumstances, um, terrorist situations, things like that. But I do believe, and one of the things I think we've seen as a reality around the state is that death penalty has been used less and less around the state and is generally used today in the most heinous of um, situations um, where it is appropriate under the law. Thank you. Mr. Epley. Thank you very much. Yes, so legislators, the lawmakers, they make the law. Judges are elected or appointed to interpret the law. So those are tough questions to answer. If that is the law, what is our role as a judge? And you do have to remember the judicial canons prevents us from giving many personal opinions. Because if a, if a certain case comes before us and I tell you this is what I believe and then it comes before me, you know you're going to either have a good shot at winning or a bad shot at losing, whichever way you look at it. So those are tough questions when you say, what are your personal beliefs when you're running for judge? The canons don't allow us to answer certain questions, but I can tell you that my role is to interpret the law, not make the law. Thank you. Thank you. Someone posed a general question to pretty much anybody who's running for judge. If elected, will you uphold the United States Constitution in its original text or as a living, breathing document? I'm not going to ask everybody up here one by one to say yes or no, but I'd like everyone to keep that in mind when you have a case before you. Um, Brian Lampton had to leave. There were two questions for him, and we will pass those on to him. And I thank you for your attention. I believe we are finished for today. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Fire Department. Thank you, Beaver Creek Women's League.